so honored to be the first um, place to 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 hear about this wonderful um, book and to celebrate you. And with that, I hand it to Professor Hajar and I ask everyone please to put on your speaker view so you can see Professor Hajar. She's going to be sharing with us a PowerPoint and Gihad and I are going to go off screen. Over to you. And Shreen, send that uh, text over to my department so I can put it in my personnel file. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> okay, so we are going to look at that one. <clears throat> um, okay. That was an incredibly, unbelievably powerful and generous uh, introduction. So thank you so much, Shireen. Um, so what I decided to do today, I mean, the book itself really spans, um, you know, this full 20 years since September 11th. But because it does span such a long period of time, and I think that there will be at least some people uh, in the audience who are not even as old as the detention facility at Guantanamo, part of the talk is gonna really be to introduce people or, or sort of cover what happened um, you know, sort of across this 20 years and really building up to the 9-11 case. But the Guantanamo itself was really, um, you know, one of the clearest manifestations of how the Bush administration decided that it was going to wage what it declared to be the response to 9-11, which was a global war on terror. So among the decisions that were made in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks was, first of all, the decision to characterize those attacks as an act of war rather than what they actually were, which was a crime against humanity. But by declaring 9-11 an act of war, the Bush administration could then declare war on those who were or who were assumed to be somehow responsible or implicated um, in the attacks. But even before 9-11 occurred, you know, the Bush, one of the things that characterizes the Bush administration and is something that has really not uh, dissipated in the last 20 years, but it really was, you know, Vice President Dick Cheney's um, sort of hobby horse was the unitary executive thesis. It's this idea, a kind of right wing idea that the president has const a constitutional right to disregard Congress or the courts when making decisions around um, foreign policy or national security issues. And so 9-11 provided an opportunity <clears throat> for this unitary executive thesis to be put into practice. And it really was a defining way of all of the policies that you know, defy the law and you know, re, you know, defy the national traditions, et cetera, were really justified on this basis. And in order to do so, it's what happens when a political democracy decides it is going to disregard its own institutions or disregard um, you know, its own laws. You have to bring in lawyers to do that. And so the government lawyers were, um, you know, in the Bush administration were there to provide a kind of legal imprimatur for the kinds of policies that um, the Bush administration either decided or opted to engage in. And so what you end up getting in the aftermath of 9-11, sort of the overarching thing was what they, these intellectual authors call the new paradigm, a new paradigm to wage <clears throat> this new uh, you know, kind of war. And the very first um, you know, sort of evidence of this, and one that we have not moved beyond yet because Guantanamo is still open, was an order, uh, a president, President George W. Bush issued an executive order on November 13th, 2001, in which he basically asserted how the U.S. government was going to wage the war on terror. So the most important element of this military order was the decree that our enemies are unlawful enemy combatants. That concept did not exist. It was invented for this purpose because you know, they declared that 9-11 was war and they were gonna go to war against 9-11. But then by creating this category of unlawful enemy combatants, they could wage war on perceived or actual enemies, but not treat those enemies as prisoners of war or give them any of the benefits of soldiers because they weren't soldiers, but also denying them status as civilians. And so with Bush's order, it was the beginning of a policy grounded in a radical, but nevertheless legalistic language that our enemies are rightless, that our enemies have no rights whatsoever. So 
that was, you know, that happened in November 2001. This is at the very beginning of the war in Afghanistan. And the war on terror began as a war for information because the U.S. government did not know much at all about Al Qaeda or whoever was responsible for the terrorist attacks. And so the desperate need for actionable intelligence, so-called actionable intelligence about terrorists and terrorist networks, et cetera, was the reason why the strategic cornerstone of the war on terror, at least for the first six years, was capture, detention, and interrogation on the assumption that um, through interrogations, the US government could acquire actionable intelligence and then defeat our terrorist enemies. But in order to make this operative, there had to be, you know, there was a decision taken by the Bush administration to disregard the Geneva Conventions. And the Geneva Conventions are, you know, the, you know, they are the laws of war. They are universally applicable because every single government on earth has signed or ratified them by 2001. And so by decreeing no Geneva Conventions, um, they were really uh, making um, lawlessness an aspect. So now we can say, why was Guantanamo selected as the main site for long-term interrogation and detention? Well, one of them is that it was, you know, Guantanamo is on a, um, you know, a piece of the island of Cuba that the United States has had a lease on since 1903. Um, and so it's been, you know, on the one hand, it's um, proximate to the east coast of the United States, uh, but it is also under you know, Guantanamo Bay is a naval base. It's under complete U.S. control, but it's not sovereign U.S. territory. And so then these right-wing lawyers who composed the War Council close to Vice President Cheney basically argued that because Guantanamo is controlled by the U.S., but not part of the U.S., therefore U.S. laws um, won't apply to what we are going to do to people detained there, nor will U.S. courts have any jurisdiction addiction over those things those practices. But this was not the first time Guantanamo Naval Base was used as a detention facility. 30 years ago, this is the picture you might have seen, which was when the um, first the George H.W. Bush and then the Bill Clinton administration used Guantanamo to detain Haitian refugees who were fleeing violence um, in, in Haiti, heading towards, you know, to seek asylum in the United States. And they were detained in the very same unspeakable uh, conditions that composed the first, uh, you know, sort of dog pens for the first detainees. So this image here, it's a very well-known image, um, at least for people who pay attention to Guantanamo. This is what the picture was 20 years ago. These are the first uh, you know, air, you know, uh, detail people who were captured in Afghanistan and who were airlifted to the south side of Cuba, um, declared to be enemy combatants. Well, if you look at what what's going on with them, I mean, you look at what these people, what you're seeing here is, by the way, first of all, this is this is a Pentagon provided picture and the Pentagon was very proud of this picture. It's like, we've got them. We got the guys who brought 9-11. And so what you see in this picture is position abuse, um, uh, sensory deprivation, and you know, basically torture. I mean, they're being they're bound up in contorted positions. They are wearing mittens, earmuffs, and goggles so that they cannot see or feel um, anything. And so, and this is the condition that they had been in since they were transported uh, from Afghanistan, which would have been, you know, days in of flying on the um, floor of uh, one of those big military airplanes. Um, but one of the ironies between just the last, the Haitians and this image, you know, which sort of sets the course is that because Guantanamo had been used to detain Haitians in the 90s, one of the people who fought the George H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations against those detentions was Michael Ratner, who <clears throat> <laughs> who was the um, is president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. I mean, he fought it before he was president. But it was when the Bush administration decided to reopen Guantanamo for the war on terror, and because he'd been there before to fight over the detention of Haitians, that he was the one who actually leads the charge against um, uh, 
you know, what was going on there. And what was going on there, this whole idea that these were unlawful enemy combatants was that they were being secretly detained. In other words, the Bush, you know, the, the Bush administration through the president's executive order had said that these people have no right to any kind of hearing or review under any circumstances. So the implication was anyone who is in US custody is an unlawful combatant and unlawful combatants have no rights, including even the right to be seen by the world. I mean, their identities were classified. But one of the aspects, you know, that is so, um, you know, sort of th that is one of the, the debacles that we haven't learned a lesson from, the, what begins as this, you know, sort of laboratory of interrogations in order to get human um, intelligence was that the U.S. government did not know who it was bringing to Guantanamo. So it was this combination of fear, ignorance, and hubris. The idea was that anyone who was captured or sold for bounty, you know, and comes into U.S. custody, the coming into U.S. custody made them an unlawful enemy combatant. And then, you know, the Bush administration drank their own Kool-Aid and basically believed these people, these people, you know, whoever we have must have actionable intelligence. And if they weren't giving any actionable intelligence up because they're like a Afghan sheep herder or, you know, uh, somebody who had gone to Afghanistan to study religion or something, the idea was that they were the sneaky, they were sneakily keeping it and therefore coercion must be used against these people. So it was this kind of cyclical set of arguments about like, you know, not knowing who they were bringing, but believing anybody that they brought must have information. They're not giving it up, use course of interrogations. So Guantanamo then becomes really, I mean, it was, you know, it was called critically a legal black hole because things were going on there that were secret from the public. Everything was classified, including the identities of all the people being brought in, et cetera. But, you know, it was a critic who called it the legal black hole, but it was people in the Bush administration's, you know, um, sort of interagency uh, detainee affairs who actually said that they wanted Guantanamo to be the legal equivalent of outer space. The government, the military who was running Guantanamo wanted to be able to interrogate people using any methods that they chose um, to not have any oversight by uh, courts to deny these people any right to lawyers, et cetera. So they were really denied um, status review hearings um, and their detention was secret. Well, secret detention, you know, the illegality of secret detention is you know what we call it's called the 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 rect rectification for that is habeas corpus or show us the body habeas corpus goes back to the magna carta and it is literally the cornerstone of the modern rule of law the idea that a tyrannical government cannot just secretly detain people without the opportunity to challenge their detention well the bush administration unitary executive thesis said like you know this president can detain whomever he wants and treat them however he wants um, but it was because of the not denial of habeas corpus that provided the opening for Michael Ratner and the Center for Constitutional Rights and a couple of other lawyers, Joe Margulis and Cl Clive uh, Stafford Smith and also then Tom Wilner to basically challenge the Bush administration. And so it was really a kind of a bold move because you know 9-11 happened in September 2001. In February of 2002, CCR, Center for Constitutional Rights and their allies filed the first lawsuit challenging secret detention at Guantanamo. And that was called, the, the lawsuit was called Rasul v. Bush. And so they had to use the names of the very few detainees whose identities were known. It happened to be three British citizens and two Australian, or and one Australian citizen. So that was Rasul v. Bush was challenging the legality of legitimate, uh, of uh, secret detentions. So, as expected, you know, the Bush administration was, you know, staggered at the idea that anyone, you know, lawyers would have the audacity to challenge the president at a time of national emergency and national war. And as anybody who knows anything about the U.S. legal system, um, particularly federal courts, will know the courts are very are loath 
to um, question or second guess executive um, decisions, particularly around warfare and um, foreign policy. And so Rasul v. Bush lost in the lower two courts. And meanwhile, what was happening at Guantanamo, everything was secret. The interrogation techniques were secret. The identities of detainees were secret. The legal memos justifying all these things were classified, et cetera. Well, what was happening, what we come to learn later, was that the, um, you know, the administration, people in the administration who don't know anything about interrogation or what actually works and don't give a shit about the law, basically decided to, you know, which tactics, if they, believe, they, they persuaded themselves that coercion was necessary and therefore legitimate to acquire actionable intelligence, but which ones should we use? And so one of the great ironies of the war on terror is that the Bush administration decided to re-engineer the techniques of a program called SEER, the SEER program. And SEER is an acronym that stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. This program was developed in the aftermath of the Korean War and continued on for ever since to train US soldiers to withstand torture if they are ever captured by a regime that disregards the Geneva Conventions and uses torture. So the Bush administration's great contribution was to actually take those techniques and re-engineer them and then adopt them as their own. So it took a while for even the first inklings of what was happening in the secret world, not only Guantanamo, but also in Bagram, and as I'll talk about in a few moments, in the CIA's uh, operations, to figure out, you know, the, the public had no way of knowing what was actually going on because everything was secret. But it was, and really to the great credit of invest, you know, some top-notch investigative journalists and human rights organizations started figuring out or finding or uncovering information as early as December 2002 that, that, that torture was not just a random thing, that there might actually be a torture policy. But every time those um, allegations were made to the Bush administration, the Bush administration did what, um, you know, torturing regimes do. There's three, you know, was deny it, you know, and anyone who has read Stanley Cohen's um, book, States of Denial, will know the first state of denial is literal denial. Like, we don't torture. So as long as everything was totally secret, the Bush administration could get away with literal uh, types of denial. Um, but then finally by, you know, just a really a game changing period of time occurred between late April and late June of 2004, like the whole game changed, you know, all the secrets kind of exploded and what was going on in the shadows comes to be revealed. And the first event in this troika of events was the Abu Ghraib scandal. And the Abu Ghraib scandal was, you know, I mean, it was a scandal, was a multi-part scandal that, you know, after the United States invaded Iraq in um, March of 2003, Bush declared, you know, victory in May of 2003, um, you, know, ex, you know, violence or an insurrection, however you would want to call it, um, insurgents, you know, I mean, the, the terms are debatable, but, you know, begins to absolutely devastate, you know, not only those U U.S. and other um, countries that invaded Iraq, but really blowing up, you know, the U.N. headquarters in Baghdad and other places. And so the desperate need, you know, we have another war, not beyond the war in Afghanistan, another war where the United States was fighting with no information, needing actionable intelligence. And so in the desperation and hubris, you know, that just followed the U.S. war policy wherever it went. You know, the um, Abu Ghraib was one of the prisons that had been used by the regime of Saddam Hussein, where, you know, uh, military police and interrogators were just you know, told to do whatever they wanted. But we live in the age of cell phones. So soldiers who were on, you know, guarding um, the prisoners of Ukraine and abusing the prisoners would take photos and then they'd circulate them to each other. And well, those photos got out. And so, uh, you know, they were publicized on April 28, 2004, and it created an absolutely worldwide um, 
worldwide scandal because of you know what it depicted um and what was also learned then you know critically by one investigative journalist named Seymour Hirsch he really he, somebody had leaked to him an internal Pentagon report written by Major General Antonio Taguba who looked into the Abu Ghraib scandal and Taguba discovered that the tactics that were being used the humiliation the violence the coercion in Abu Ghraib had actually already been used used in Guantanamo and Afghanistan, and those techniques had migrated. So that was like the beginning of a realization that like the government is a torture regime. It was because of the Abu Ghraib scandal that Congress finally rouses itself from its sleepy slumber, you know, to start asking questions like what are the Bush administration's interrogation and detention operations? And as a result of that kind of pressure from Congress, the Bush administration felt impelled to start releasing some documents including what were immediately characterized as the um, as torture memos, which provides, you know, material evidence that torture was uh, authorized from the top and it was policy. And so those are those are the two. And then the third event, which occurs at the end of June, was that, you know, against the losses in the lower courts, uh, Michael Ratner, CCR, and their allies beat the Bush administration in the Supreme Court in the case of Rasul v. Bush. The Supreme Court basically said that you cannot hold people indefinitely in secret, that they must have um, the right to challenge their detention. Um, but it was the confluence of events, Abu Ghraib, big scandal, torture memos, big scandal for lawyers, and then the Rasul v. Bush decision that, you know, all these lawyers, angry lawyers around the country, conservatives and, and liberals and others, seized upon this decision in the Supreme Court to volunteer to become lawyers for Guantanamo detainees, to become habeas counsels for Guantanamo detainees. Now, you think that the Bush administration might have learned a lesson, like they, you know, their torture program had been exposed and their whole policy of interrogation and detention had been, you know, defeated in the Supreme Court, but the Bush administration learned absolutely nothing. There were no um, changes. And so Guantanamo, one way that the Bush administration sought to, um, justify continuing detention at Guantanamo and to try to circumvent federal courts, even though the Supreme Court had just ruled that detainees had a right to have a federal court review their habeas petitions, was to create these kangaroo courts called combatant status review tribunals. So, and then the government would basically secretly hold secret hearings with secret evidence. Detainees would you know, be asked questions, given no opportunity to prove their in innocence if they were innocent, et cetera. And so, you know, unsurprisingly, the hundreds of people who were in Guantanamo by 2004 or so, um, you know, just were deemed legitimately to be continued to be detained. But the thing that did change was that because of the Rasul decision, lawyers, the lawyers who had volunteered to start representing Guantanamo detainees, sign up you know to get their security clearances and going to Guantanamo to meet their clients so this creates you know one of, one of the great interesting like paradoxes of the bush the war on terror during the bush years it was that these lawyers could go they could meet people who'd been secretly detained and tortured for years so they could learn the secrets but they couldn't tell the secrets because they were forced by the Pentagon to sign protective orders that meant that everything that they learned or heard from their clients or saw at Guantanamo was must be treated as classified and anybody who violated it could be criminally prosecuted. So it was like this way where, where lawyers were forced to become um, unwilling collaborators in, in the secrecy surrounding Guantanamo, but you do get so many um, uh, you know, sort of people learning th some of the secrets. And so the military commissions that had been created by President Bush's, um, uh, you know, 2001 November military order start trying to prosecute people, you know, and <laughs> as it turns out, when you start, when the military commissions start trying to prosecute people in 2005, and, um, and so who did they have? They had Cook, Osama bin Laden's cook, Osama bin Laden's 
driver, you know, so it wasn't like these um, high level people that would justify this whole operation. But moreover, everybody who was being prosecuted, uh, and there was very few of them, uh, all of them had been tortured. And one of the things that was, you know, to me, one of the most um, fascinating, you know, things that forced me to rethink my, some of my views was that military lawyers, military lawyers who were designed, assigned by the Pentagon to defend detainees in the military commissions were so appalled that the Bush administration would have disregarded the Geneva Conventions and invented this fake, you know, court system, the commissions that bore no resemblance to either, you know, military court marshals or federal courts. And so military lawyers joined forces with civilian lawyers to start fighting all of these various um, uh, wartime policies. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But meanwhile, meanwhile, well, what's going on in military detention in Afghanistan and Guantanamo, there was a whole separate operation, which was the CIA program. It was called the Rendition Detention and Interrogation Program that the CIA was authorized uh, to use five days after the 9-11 attacks. Um, President Bush, you know, basically decided to treat the CIA as the tip of the spear in waging the war on terror because the CIA is able to operate under complete secrecy and the CIA is not subject to any laws. I mean, the CIA is basically an organized, you know, criminal enterprise, but it was it, so that kind of, you know, like prerogatives and discretion that the CIA had was one that they were basically given responsibility to capture and disappear and interrogate use. And so the, the legality of torture techniques were really originally done for the CIA itself. And they were could hold them in black, what were called black sites or secret prisons. And on this map, you can see the various places where there were either CIA run black sites or in the case of, for example, Egypt and Morocco and Ethiopia, et cetera, where um, the you know, torturers from those countries would function as proxy torturers for the CIA. So once people were taken into CIA custody, they were literally disappeared. And they were moved around this gulag of black sites and, and extraordinary uh, rendition um, enterprise. And the thing about the CIA program was that they were really, the idea was that they were the ones who were going for the top terrorists in order to get the actionable intelligence in order to prevent the next attack. So the CIA doesn't care about the law. It's you know, not subject to the law. And so they certainly, unlike the role or the mandate of the FBI, were not um, trying to get confessions that could be used in court. Um, but the, uh, you know, so it, it was, you know, basically the CIA program was forced disappearance, kidnapping, and brutal torture, etc. So that was what the government had authorized. But, you know, once again, the lawyers <laughs> beat the Bush administration. It was military lawyer, a, a military lawyer teaming up with a Georgetown University law professor. So it was Lieutenant Commander Charles Swift and Neil Katyal, um, who sued uh, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld over the illegality of the military commissions. And in that Supreme Court ruling in Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, which came out on June 29, 2006, that was really the way I would evaluate it as the death knell for the torture program because the Supreme Court basically said anyone in U.S. custody is um, has privileged the benefit at least of comp what's called common article three of the Geneva Conventions, which means, um, which is often called the humanitarian baseline. And under the common article three, no torture, no outrages on human dignity, no cruel treatment. And the Supreme Court reminded the Bush administration violations of common article three are war crimes. So, uh-oh, you know, there goes the torture program, but you can't undo torture. So does the Bush administration learn anything from that debacle? No. In, um, you know, it's September of 2006, President Bush, for the first time in, in a context of criticizing the Supreme Court for its Hamdan decision, acknowledges the existence of the CIA torture program because since common article three applies the CIA can no longer continue running its torture program and then announces that um, 14 uh, you know, people formerly held in CIA custody were about to be moved 
to the um, to Guantanamo, where they remain today. Um, but he also the the Hamdan decision had also wiped out the presidentially created military commission. So since Congress was controlled by Republicans at that time, the White House created and the Republican led Congress passed what was called the Military Commissions Act, which basically gave back to the administration what the Supreme Court had taken away, which was the ability to use tortured evidence. Um, since these are military commissions and you're prosecuting non soldiers, uh, the crimes that we prosecuted in the military commissions were all invented. They're not actual war crimes. Um, and also, you know, just the use of torture. But the other thing that the um, Military Commission Act did, which really continues to this day, it has never been undone, was to, it wrote into the law, ex post facto immunity for war crimes. So that means all the torture and all the kidnapping and all the illegal things that any US um, agents or agents of the state had engaged in could not be prosecuted in US court. So it was like a guarantee that the crimes of the immediate past would never uh, be held to account. Um, so when the high value detainees were moved, 14 were moved to Guantanamo in September of 2006, and this includes Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. It includes the first detainee who was ever taken into CIA custody. His name is Abu Zubaida, um, who you know, was originally assumed part of the hubris and ignorance uh, to be a top level Al-Qaeda operative. He wasn't even a member of Al-Qaeda, but he provided, the, he was the guinea pig through which the CIA developed its torture program. And the image on the left is his self portrait of him, you know, what waterboarding was like when he was there. But now, so the thing is, these guys are moved out of, out of, out of the complete darkness of the CIA program and into the gray zone of Guantanamo. But because everything that had been done to them by the CIA with White House approval was a secret, and it was a secret because it was a crime, although the, the allegation is that, you know, sources and methods must be kept secret. Um, the, these, these 14 people were themselves secret. And so they had to be classified. They were, you know, classifying human beings. So they were held in a secret facility and journalists couldn't even know the name of it. It was, this is a Google shot. It's called, it was called Camp 7. And this was a total, it was essentially as people would describe it, it was like a dark gray site. You know, they'd been brought from the black sites to the dark gray sites. And that's where they um, were housed. So the process of um, trying people in the military commissions, you know, this starts in the Bush administration. This is the old military commission building. It was the for on Guantanamo, it was the former um, dental clinic on the base. And the reason why I used both this photo that I took and this drawing that somebody, an artist um, did, is it shows you like when people, when journalists are at Guantanamo, you know, we can physically see whatever we can see, but we cannot convey to the wider world anything that is, you know, does not pass um, sensors. And so we were always told very specifically that there are, you know, if you're taking a picture of the building or drawing it, whatever you have to like exclude. So you can't know what's to the left or the right. I know. And you can call me and I'll tell you, but um, the, you know, you can't bring those images out. So I'm not going to say much about this other than that, you know, the military commissions begin prosecuting people during Bush um, and Ultimately, the Obama administration decided for whatever reasons, despite the fact that President Obama promised to close Guantanamo, um, he kept the military commissions going. And the one point I would just make about that is the, the handful of people, the eight or so people who were prosecuted and their cases are done in the military commissions, every single one of them except, and this goes from the Bush administration or the Obama administration, every single one of those convictions with the exception of one charge against one um, were ultimately thrown out because they didn't, you know, once they reached federal courts and appeal. So all of this stuff about the small military commissions has just been a giant, giant waste of time. But the real show, the real action was, um, 
the um, you know the the high security military court, which was built right after um, the CIA prisoners were moved to Guantanamo. And it was really built in order to prosecute, it was specifically designed for the 9-11 case, for five people the government accused of responsibility for, um, for those things. But it was like some serious magical thinking on the part of the Bush administration the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, that you can produce a case or an outcome in a legal case where information is classified and the defendants whom the government is seeking, administration after administration, is seeking to find guilty and execute were tortured by the CIA. So that has been a major reason, one of the major reasons why Guantanamo is still um, open. But so just to say like in that high security courtroom, this is not, I mean, the picture is too enlarged, but so the, the courtroom itself was built with six tables because the original plan was that there were gonna be six defendants in the 9-11 case. One of them uh, did it was sort of uh, excused for, for the torture he suffered. But the, the only place where, you know, to have a putatively public trial and who constitutes the public, journalists, non-governmental organization observers, and in the 9-11 case, um, family members of 9-11 victims. So the, the high security courtroom was built with a gallery in the back, soundproofed, and the, and the audio feed from the courtroom has a 40 second delay. Because why? Because these the people on trial were tortured by the CIA and what the CIA did to them is still a secret. So if somebody, one of the defendants or a lawyer or somebody starts talking specifically about CIA torture or the locations where the black site were, which although they're known, the government still regards as classified, the sound can be cut, a red light can, can um, go on, and it's, you know, it, it, it keeps the public, which is represented by these groups, from being able to know what's actually happening. But so inside the 9-11 military commission case, there's a couple of other cases going on. Now there's, I believe, three other cases involving former CIA uh, detainees. But the 9-11 case is really perhaps the most important one. And it really, it's, it's since 2006, this case has become the like, whole raison d'etre for the existence of Guantanamo, the continuing existence of Guantanamo and the military commissions. Because what do you, how are you gonna try these people who are accused of responsibility for killing close to 3,000 people and then were tortured for three to four years by the CIA like, where else are you going to prosecute them other than in these, you know, problematic military commissions? And so that is, you know, really one of the main reasons why uh, this case, you know, is so significant. If it ever actually goes to trial, it will be the largest criminal case in U.S. history because of the number of victims. I mean, the, the charge sheet reads the names of 2,976 people who were the direct casualties of the terrorist attacks of September 11th. But it also, one of the aspects of this case is that what makes it so paradoxical and such a debacle on so many levels is that you have more victims than any single crime, but the defendants are also victims. They're victims of CIA torture. And this is a death penalty case. And in death penalty cases, heightened due process applies. And so the lawyers who represent the defendants include like the top notch death penalty lawyers, that each of them has a military lawyer, at least one death penalty lawyers. Every team has between three and every defense team has between three and four um, people. But just to say, look, just to give you a sense of this case and how it evolved, and just I'm gonna zoom back to the Bush administration for one moment. When these guys were brought in, the new military commission building was built in, in um, you know, in 2007. And then these five men were arraigned in June of 2008. This was the last year of President Bush's presidency. And the, you know, the magical thinking Bush administration imagined that they could get these guys tried, convicted and executed by January 2009, when Bush would be out of office. Well, what happened was at the, um, you know, at a hearing in December of 2008, you know, getting to the end of Bush's time, uh, these 
uh, individuals led by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Walid bin Al-Attash, Ramzi bin Al-Shiba, uh, Amar al-Baluchi, and Mustafa Hausawi, they basically, in a sense, made an offer. They said they would be willing to plead guilty on the condition that they go immediately to execution. Well, <laughs> as idealistic as that might sound, um, that, that wasn't actually a legal option. So the case fell apart. Then the Obama administration comes in with all these lofty liberal promises of closing Guantanamo and ending torture and restoring the rule of law. And the original plan was to try these guys in New York as then Attorney General Eric Holder said, close to the scene of the crime, 9-11. Um, but then, you know, right-wing hysteria breaks out and the Obama administration, if it did, does one thing consistently, it's not standing by its own principles. And so that collapsed and these guys were rearranged, you know, the military commissions being the only option. So this trial, they, they were arraigned in 2012 the case is still in the pre-trial phase. It means like they're nowhere near going to trial. And so why is that? Um, you know, why is it stuck in the pre-trial phase? And this is like most of the times I've been to Guantanamo have been to, as I go as a journalist and it's to observe and report on the 9-11 case. This case doesn't, you know, aside from Carol Rosenberg, who, who was reporting for the Miami Herald and now works for the New York Times and who is literally a national treasure because she has been to Guantanamo constantly. I mean, everything we know about Guantanamo, we know that thanks to Carol Rosenberg. But, you know, the many of the times where like I'd be one of the, you know, Carol Rosenberg would always be there. I'd be there. There'd be another guy, John Ryan, who's also been scrupulously covering this case. But very few journalists would go down. Why? Because, frankly, what's going on in this case is not headline news. The defense lawyers have been fighting for years to get full access to the information about how their clients were treated in CIA custody. And they say, this is a death penalty case. We have a right to that information. And how our clients were treated is relevant to how this case is going to operate. The prosecutors say, uh-uh, you know, you know, they basically, the prosecutors are basically carrying water for the CIA. So what they've been giving for years are substitutions and summaries about what these um, five individuals went through for their years in CIA black sites. And the prosecutor's line is, you know, this case is about 9-11 and whatever happened to the defendants after 9-11 and their responsibility therein is irrelevant, which is considering that those that statement is made by people with technically legal training. It's a shocking, shocking statement, but that's where we are with this particular case. And so there have been fights, fights, fights over, um, you know, sort of the defense trying to get information about what happened to their uh, clients. Um, but there were a couple of interesting developments, just to um, nearing sort of the end. But the, the, the one of the things was, you know, going back to this theme of magical thinking. When the Bush administration brought these 14 people from the CIA black sites and we're like, okay, now they're at Guantanamo, I guess we got to try them. You know, we can't use anything they said to the CIA while they were being waterboarded or rectally rehydrated or, you know, uh, held in, you know, protracted isolation for months. So we need to get clean statements. So they, they recruit the FBI to send clean teams down to Guantanamo in January of 2007. And the, these people who'd only been you know, out of black sites you know, for a couple of months, they're interrogated by FBI agents and those clean team statements were the bulk of the government's case. Well, one of the things that it makes it, you know, one of the justifications in my mind for going to Guantanamo as often as I can is like you see what happens. So in February, I'm sorry, in December of 2017, 2017, finally defense lawyers get information about how the clean team process work because they want to fight those statements, you know, on the grounds that they were uh, the, the statements that their clients made to the FBI were coerced. And what you what this, um, you know, what this revolution revelation in December of 2017 reveals is that the CIA was running the FBI clean team operation. So the whole idea that the FBI was clean or their hands were clean or, you know, whatever these guys said, you know, when they were in CIA custody, well, no bearing on the case, bullshit. And that, you know, February, 2017, you know, who was 
uh, president during 2017. Um, you know, and so the other aspect of the issue um, what, th that's been crucial and really a turning point in this case has been, and it started in September of 2019, was that the defense teams made a move, and that's what the move is still ongoing, to suppress the statements that these people, that these um, defendants made to the FBI. They want to suppress them. You know, they want to argue that those statements are in like legal terms, fruit of the poisonous tree. Like there is no after torture. However, these guys acted and whatever they said to the FBI, even though they were not technically still in CIA custody, they are nevertheless remain tortured. And so therefore those statements should be thrown out. Well, the, you know, that's what's really going on up until now. So it's like the suppression hearings in the 9-11 case, you know, in a context where there has been no accountability for CIA torture, everything is still a classified secret. What you're seeing is that the 9-11 case, the defense is trying to put the CIA on trial. And so the two architects of the CIA torture program, James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, who are uh, contractor psychologists um, who had developed and run the CIA torture program, they actually testified, uh, came in and testified as part of the suppression hearings in the January 2020 um, hearings. And so one of the things that, you know, the defense lawyers were asking was, you know, I mean, many aspects of like, but one thing was, what was the lie? I mean, we, we kind of know it, but getting Getting Mitchell or Mitchell in particular, he did most of the talking to put it on the open record. The, the logic of the torture program was learned helplessness. In other words, these guys believed that the people that they were interrogating have actionable intelligence and they are resistant to giving it. And the only way to uh, break them is to subject them to conditions in which they will, you know, acquire a sense of debility, disorientation, and dread. And then their theory went that once they're broken, once they become, have acquired learned helplessness, then the interrogators can just scoop out all the delicious actionable intelligence in their brains. You know, and so during these two weeks of hearings in January 2020, you know, with extended conversations about like what these different techniques did or worked or whatever. And so one of the things that, you know, one of the things that we know was that, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind of 9-11 was waterboarded 120, 183 times. And so on the stand, you know, um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's lawyer is asking James Mitchell about this waterboarding experience or what work, he said, what worked on my client? And what Mitchell said was, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was, you know, waterboarding didn't really work on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed because, you know, he had big lips and he was, he was able to, you know, uh, you know, Get, the water couldn't go into his mouth like he was able to eject the water. But the technique that really did work um, effectively on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was walling. And so walling was is a procedure where um, like a towel is rolled up and put around someone's neck and a string is attached and then they're slammed into a wall and then yanked back. So it both creates a banging against the wall plus a whiplash effect. And so Mitchell said that, oh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed really actually, you know, walling was the thing that worked um, you know, most effectively on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. But just to, you know, conclude this particular point is that in 2018, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's lawyer, um, you know, brought to the courts that did the military commission's attention that according to an MRI uh, that had been done on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, MRI, you know, exams were done on all of the CIA, former CIA prisoners. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has, has mental, has brain damage. And the brain damage is a result of walling. And so again, if you bring it back to the big picture, like you can't really execute somebody, that, you know, that you actually caused brain damage while they were in custody. And so it's just, you know, the 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 incommensurability of torture, you know, and justice, you know, either for the defendants or for the thousands of victims, 
of 9-11 is just an absolute uh, impossibility. And the 9-11 case really shows that. So this is just to illustrate sort of what we have, like who's been there. Um, and this is what the status is today. So there have been a total of 700 of people who were ever detained at Guantanamo. 500 some were actually released during the Bush administration. Those who were decided didn't have any more actionable intelligence. Um, and others, a couple 240 were released during the Obama administration. Nine of them died as only one detainee left during the four Trump years, and that was on the basis of a pre-negotiated agreement. He was repatriated to Saudi Arabia. So currently 39 people remain imprisoned. And I just had to change these two numbers today because it used to be 13 had been cleared for release and 14 were categorized as forever prisoners, but the Biden administration just announced that one of the 14 CIA prisoners, one who's never been accused or, or charged with anything, he's from Somalia, I think, I forget his name, but he's just been cleared for release someday. But the 14 um, forever prisoners include, or the 13 forever prisoners include Abu Zubaydah, who wasn't a member of Al-Qaeda, who was the guinea pig for the CIA's torture program. It also includes Mohammed al Qatani, who was the guinea pig for the military's uh, torture program. Both of them are considered forever prisoners. 10 are on trial in the military commissions, including the 9-11-5, and two of them have been convicted. One is the guy convicted during the Bush years, and one, Majid Khan, who agreed to a plea bargain and actually testified about his torture before the CIA uh, last month. So ultimately, just to conclude now, you know, it really is that Guantanamo remains open, um, you know, because of the 9-11 case and because of the lack of a political will to you know, sort of deal with these things. The only way to close Guantanamo would be to offer plea bargains to anybody who's charged and release everybody else. But what is the lesson that we should learn? We, we should learn that this was an unmitigated disaster, a self-inflicted wound, it, like an avoidable thing. But the narrative, this is a battle for narratives. No official Democrat or Republican has ever taken full ownership that this was a horrific and ongoing debacle. And so I think that that really, my concluding point is that, you know, really this is all a battle for narratives. And this is a where enlightened and informed citizens have a great role to play. I'm sorry I took a long time, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, and I'm going to hand it over to Gehad. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hajar, for this uh, extremely insightful, powerful, and important talk today. Uh, I learned so much from re reading your transcript and from listening to your presentation. Um, there are several things that I admired about your book. Uh, both in the depths of the overall messages that particularly stood out to me and in the richness of its details as an account of 20 years of US torture and its broad implications. Um, I admire that your book was unap unapologetically clear in its political objectives. From the onset, you tell a wide audience of prospective readers that you hope this book will be a contribution to the quote goals that motivated and animated the fight against torture. Uh, some of the powerful points and takeaways that I learned from your book are that, one, the specter of torture still looms and haunts U.S. clicks. There are lingering remains of the now-closed torture program, and the official refusal to recognize or redress the U.S. torture program as a crime means that torture could be resurrected as government policy in the future. Uh, two, torture does not work. The U.S. government's use of torture was an abject failure for its own goals. It is at the center of the reasons why the victims of the September 11 um, attack on the Twin Towers have not gained justice. Torture and justice are incompatible, as you write in your book. And three, uh, the war in court uh, holds lessons about the past, the present, and the future, particularly from the labor of lawyers that you highlight in your book. Uh, those lawyers led a series of uh, legal battles that challenged US torture policy. Uh, and from those lawyers and from the way you conclude your book, we learned about the, we learn about the possibility of a reckoning when the truth can quote be heard and known unquote. Uh, I really appreciated your writing style as it was very rich in details, and it leaves much for the reader to analyze and interpret. 
It is a smooth read without academic jargon and footnotes, which was very intentional as you write in your acknowledgement to your father. Uh, another aspect uh, in the book that I appreciated was the colorful style in which you describe being present in the Guantanamo military commissions. You describe who was there, how they acted, what they said, and how journalists and NGO workers responded to and analyzed each day's happenings. Through your account, we hear many voices, defense lawyers, prosecutors, judges, psychiatrists, journalists, NGO workers, family members of victims, and detainees. For example, Omar Khadr, who had just turned 16 when he arrived at Guantanamo on allegations that he had killed a US soldier with a grenade in Afghanistan, told the commission's judge that he wanted to boycott the military commission. When the judge asked Khadr if he ever studied law, he responded, this is a military commission. You don't need to study the law. The judge asked Khadr, uh, what is your education? And Khadr responded, five years in the military commissions. In another 2019 hearing, there is a quote from the defense attorney, James Connell, who says to the judge, I would be remiss if I did not remark that today is the historic occasion of the decision of the United States, my government, to use torture as an instrument of policy and investigation. We'll hear important testimony today about the events of 9-11, a mass murder in which many people were killed. The trajectory of our nation's history was changed and many people, some of whom are in this courthouse, suffered. The key to this hearing, and I would suggest as a policy matter above my pay grade to the healing of our country, is to understand that both of those narratives are true at the same time. Another lawyer, Alka uh, Pradhan, told the judge in a different hearing that torture is, your honor, the nasty center of this case, whether we like it or not, and we have to deal with it at some point. Professor, Professor Hajar uh, shares many other powerful quotes with us. The book recounts the reasons we should care about the remaining 39 detainees that are still in Guantanamo Bay. These reasons echo the statement that the Center for Constitutional Rights, which features prominently in the book and has featured in this talk, uh, released to mark the 20 years into the fight against torture in Guantanamo. The center wrote in their website, um, quote, we can no longer tolerate the US government's use of indefinite de uh, detention without charge or trial, nor can we tolerate the US government's failure to address the harm it has caused, including the racist, xenophobic, and anti-Muslim sentiment that Guantanamo's existence continues to perpetuate, unquote. The torture that the US government and CIA undertook played a formative role in the continuous racialization of Muslims in and beyond the US. The fact that this was a detention center designed primarily for Muslim men and boys in a space where the US confined, had previously confined thousands of Haitian refugees is important and symbolic of these processes of racialization. The question of whose body can be legally or justifiably marked by torture is a racial one. Additionally, the questions of secrecy, access to information, euphemisms that obscure, and memory are also at the heart of the story of Guantanamo. The torture was justified as a means of acquiring actionable intelligence, though of course we know that torture is not an effective method of obtaining accurate information. At the same time, access to information surrounding Guantanamo, the torture program, and the U.S. Uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Investigations remains highly restrictive. The lawyers' fight against torture was also a fight for transparency, transparency and access to information. Um, I would like to get the discussion started with a few questions, and of course, you don't you can choose which ones uh, to address. Um, first, uh, this book seems like a labor of many, many years, and at times it was painful to read, and I can imagine it was much more painful to write. Um, I also, I enjoyed learning about your research process in the book, um, particularly the fact that you went to Guantanamo as a journalist, uh, and I was wondering if you can uh, elaborate on this process for us. So how was the experience of traveling to Guantanamo? Did you always have a clear goal in mind? Um, why did you choose to focus on the law as a battlefield for lawyers? Uh, also, it seems like uh, many of these lawyers you had known or seen for years. So um, I was curious about what changes you watched them undergo and about what kind of challenges um, arose for you in the process. And then second, uh, I know that your research project initially began with questions about um, the Israeli military court system and its torture practices. Um, your book mentions uh, several instances that connect torture practices globally. For example, there's a Harvard law professor um, 
whose article you mentioned uh, is titled, uh, Let America Take Its Cues from Israel Regarding Torture. Um, additionally, detainees uh, were threatened to be sent to Egypt and Israel, and in other instances, they were uh, rendered to Syria, Egypt, or Morocco, where they experienced uh, torture and abuse. So my question is about the broader implications of U.S. torture globally and um, and what you think or uh, a reckoning or official like um, addressing of the failures of this torture program could mean for torture on a global level. Uh, and then finally, I'm really curious about like the differences between torture for confession, torture for uh, acquiring information, and um, and then the role torture plays in nationalist propaganda uh, through this idea um, of we're doing this for you. Um, so what do you think makes this, these distinctions important, um, even when they're all failing? And that's it. Thank you so much for this talk. and this book and I think it's amazing. Thank you so much, Gahed. I mean, I hope you guys don't, um, you don't mind that I'm gonna actually take the last question first, like the, the different purpose, because that's the easiest one to answer. So, you know, the thing about, one of the things that um, about torture, like torture is universally illegal. I mean, it is, you know, <laughs> no matter how people, euphemize, governments euphemize it or, you know, deny that they're doing it, like it, it's like torture as such is illegal. But one can say, like, how do you how do you think about torture? Like, I mean, so in order to understand what is specific about torture, I mean, torture is intentionally harming people who are in custody, but have not been, you know, but it's not part of a court ordered punishment. So while torture may look the same, you know, for whatever various purposes, or torture might look like domestic abuse, like the custodial relationship is what really distinguishes torture. So there's really, you know, sort of uh, four purposes that torture serves. So one, which is, you know, one can think about like, and what I really learned through my earlier research on, you know, the Israeli military courts is the idea that what we would call judicial torture, when people are tortured for statements or information that can then be used in a legal process in order to convict them. So that's what we call judicial torture. And to some extent, a lot of the, you know, what, what happened in the latter years with the Guantanamo detainees becomes judicial torture. But another purpose of torture, which is much more what the War on Terror torture program, its original purpose was for actionable intelligence. So that would be called interrogational torture. The idea that when, you know, in desperate um, efforts to gain information about shadowy enemies, those who are captured or then interrogated, for, for forward acting or forward looking purposes. Um, a third what also could constitute torture in a sense is what we call penal torture. So penal torture, like the death penalty is not torture because the death penalty, I mean, legally is ordered as is the result of court ordered legal processes. But when law enforcement um, actors, police or others decide to punish people through physical brutality or some other means outside of a legal process, that would be called penal torture. And then finally, terroristic torture is when a government, particularly authoritarian regimes, totalitarian regimes, torture some people in order to intimidate all people. So it's a means of sustaining quiescence or repression out of fear. So those are the purposes of torture. Um, in terms of the, the process of book writing, so yes, you in the first question you had asked and you'd said, uh, you know, point to like, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't, you know, you know, when I was nine years old playing with Barbies or whatever, I didn't say like, someday I'm going to grow up and be a torture expert. You know, I mean, it was really, it comes about as, a, you know, how one's fate, particularly as an academic, leads you. And even when I first started um you know, I was, you know, a graduate student during the first Palestinian Intifada in the West Bank in Gaza and a sociologist. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna go study the social movements of the Intifada. And um, a very wise, uh, you know, faculty uh, advisor of mine, Talal Assad, who I had the benefit of working with, said, pick a topic that'll still be there by the time you get to the field. And he was right, like the, the unified national leadership of the uprising was not there by the time I got to the field in early 19. 90. So, you know, then my idea was, okay, I'm going to study the military courts. Those will be there for a while. But I was thought I was going to be studying nationalism. I didn't know anything about law. I mean, I like law, but, you know, in a 
hobbyistic, you know, uh, way. But so once I got to the field, I mean, this is one of the great things about field work is like you go and you see and learn things and it challenges your very perceptions. And I realized, you know, like torture was an essential means by which Israel could maintain its control of Palestinians in the occupied territories because torture was necessary to charge, convict, and imprison them. And so in the, that period of time, torture was absolutely essential. And then I also could see the role that lawyers were playing in that context. So by the time 9-11 happened, I was already, you know, sort of waiting or expecting to see, I mean, it anticipated that the US government would go down a similar path than Israel, and it exactly did, not only in torture, but also in targeted killing and the similar claims to make, um, you know, targeted killing uh, legal. But so it was, um, you know, it's that kind of fascination with the law as a battlefield. I mean, I think for sociologists in particular and other uh, scholars, historians in a different perhaps time periods, you really can see like the, I mean, lawyers, I always jokingly tell my lawyer friends, it's like, lawyers are like, you know, the plumbers, you know, they're going in and working with the law, but you need the sociologists to be like, we need to dig new ditches over here. You know, it's like the high, you know, the mountaintop is where sociologists reside to be able to understand aspects of the law. And so really see, I mean, obviously many lawyers know that, but it is this idea of the law as a battlefield and the appreciation perhaps coming out of my earlier uh, research was that, you know, while lawyers are in some ways trained to think about their work in terms of winning and losing cases, like sociology of law takes a different perspective. I mean, it's like the fights themselves, regardless of the outcome, are transformative of a legal landscape, especially where the law is a battlefield. And so the kinds of fights that my book details in rather <laughs> elaborate length is, is really about writing a, a piece of history that is still being written. But just as far as... Um, the, you know, was it painful? Like, I mean, I'm one of those, you know, like, you know, I say like, kids don't try this at home, but um, I actually, you know, find the most rewarding research topics is like when I research things I hate, right? I, I don't want to study things I like. I want to study, like, I like hate and anger are the great motivators and becoming an expert on that which you hate is to me, like the whole reason for being an academic at all. It's like, you go, so I can like, you know, talk about Dick Cheney or, you know, unitary executive thesis or all kinds of things that I hate, you know, <laughs> at, at, at rather great length. Um, and then finally, you had asked about, um, you know, that the learning that I, the book talks about how the learning is collaborative collaborative, um, or I don't know if that was your question, but everything about, you know, all of these aspects, you know, all the, all of the lawyers, the journalists, the human rights activists, the other kinds of activists, you know, the civil society people, you know, Code Pink and um, et cetera, who have pushed back and fought against not just torture, but and Guantanamo, but other illegal policies, everything, because so much of it was secret and so, and, and so many things were new, like created from whole cloth, you find this environment where nobody has all the answers. The, the answers don't even exist, right? When you're trying to figure out what to do about things, policies, or programs that had never existed before. And so it was absolutely essential for people to share their knowledge with each other. So learning was a very collaborative process and constantly people constantly learning from each other, but acting is also very collaborative. I mean, there is not gonna be a white knight that's gonna save anybody out of this, you know? Um, um, you know, it really is this kind of collaborative endeavors. And I would just, you know, reiterate a point I concluded my talk with that. It's about, you know, people, anybody should, you know, sort of educate themselves about these issues and then be part of the narratives, right? This is a battle for narratives, you know, because it's like, you know, history is being written in the present. It'll be read in the future, but it's being written now. So hopefully I addressed your comments. Shreena, thank you, you, thank are you, you doing both. Yes, okay. I am doing Q and A. Thank you both. Thank you, Gihad. Thank you, Lisa, for that really bracing talk, and Gihad for your um, amazing engagement and questions. I have a couple of my own questions, but I'm going to open it up to everyone who is in um, 
the webinar to please, if you have questions, if you could put them in the Q&A. We do have a question already um, from an anonymous attendee. I'm gonna ask you this question, um, give people some time to think of their own before I give you mine. Um, is it true that Mitchell was reported to have personally waterboarded Khalid Sheikh Muhammad? Yes. That's absolutely true. <laughs> That's absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he did. I mean, he was the hands on guy. He and, and uh, Jessen were the ones who ran, you know, the program initially and certainly were the ones conducting the interrogations of the most high value. There were probably other, you know, CIA agents and contractors who were involved at different phases. I mean, it wasn't like Mitchell was you know, nonstop in the black sites, but he definitely was, um, you know, uh, the the primary interrogator for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And in his testimony in January, because I was at Guantanamo in, for the hearings in January 2020, and like he went on for days. And one of the things that he explained, and I ha have this in the book, you know, it comes out of the, you know, what, what happened in court that day, was that, you know, I mean, he was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is, a, you know, he's a smart guy. He's a terrible terrorist, but he's a smart guy. And so Mitchell and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed would have what Mitchell described as fireside chats. So now remember, like Mitchell's a psychologist. So one of the things, and, and he's, his objective is to produce learned helplessness. And one of the ways of producing learned helplessness is to talk to the not yet helpless to figure out what would make them helpless. So he and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed would have these so-called fireside chats where uh, Mitchell would ask Ask Muhammad, you know, like, how did it feel when I waterboarded you? Or what were you, what were you, what were you thinking so that they could learn? I mean, it was really the classic, um, and, and I mean, Mitchell is absolutely unapologetic, but it was, the CIA torture program was human experimentation. And everything that Mitchell has said about his own involvement affirms that, you know, despite the fact that human experimentation was categorically apt outlawed in the aftermath of World War II and the Nazi Holocaust, you know, the United States, you know, ran a human experimentation program and it has a face. Its face is James Mitchell. Thank you. We have a second question from Tini Mukherjee, who says, when do you think that, <laughs> when do you think the 9-11 case will fully go to trial if it's still in the pre-trial phase? Uh, I don't think that this case can go to trial because of the fact that you know, there's real lawyers, real defense lawyers with real death penalty experience um, who simply are, you know, it's their job to make sure that their clients get a fair trial. And, you know, the government is not, uh, you know, um, like ready to give them what they insist on is necessary for a fair trial, which is you know, all of the primary documents about the CIA torture program. So there's like, 60 million original pages of documents. And it's the basis for um, the investigation of the, the, the Senate investigation of the CIA torture program, which then ultimately was the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Report, which was completed in 2012, kind of only the executive summary was released in 2014 in a heavily redacted version. But like if the government wanted to you know, move this thing to trial and have it appear as if like there's even a, like a resemblance of due process, then the government should give the defense teams this classified, full, unredacted 6,300 page report about what the CIA did in its um, thing. So in other words, all the questions that the government refuses to answer are answered in the Senate Select Committee report, but it's classified, it's hidden, it's locked away and the defense lawyers can't have it. So, you know, it's kind of like, how many years are we going to go before the government realizes, you know, administ Bush, you know, Democratic and Republican administrations, you cannot have your torture and eat your justice too. It's like, what they should just do is agree to plea bargains, bite the bullet. You're not going to be able to execute people that you accuse of responsibility for 9-11 because you tortured them. And then, you know, sort of that would be that. That's the way to end the 9-11 case. But if it goes to Trump, but there, no, there's, you know, it's like it's a long game of, you know, the government's playing chicken. That seems like a very unpalatable uh, option, given the fact that almost 3,000 people died on 9-11 to then just like plea bargain after all this 
tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in energy and you know expenditures and et cetera to just basically do a plea bargain, which they could have done six years ago. You know, I mean, it just, it, it, it's one of those, it's sort of the larger takeaway of my talk is that the US government or the United States, and let's speak about this more broadly, has a national incapacity to acknowledge errors and, and, and um, what's it called, course correct in real time. Like there is no, nothing that was ever done, a horrific chapter, a dark chapter of US history that was recognized as a dark chapter and an egregious error in its own time. I mean, you get, you know, Reagan apologizing for the World War II um, detention of Japanese Americans, Clinton apologizing for the 1950s, you know, um, Tuskegee experiments, et cetera. But like, there is no capacity in this country for people who have the power to, you know, make these kind of stands to acknowledge mistakes in real time. So we are just, you know, circling the bowl of, you know, denialism, basically. So I have, I have my own question. And then I think there's a really pop, uh, powerful question from um, Colleen in the audience who I met just before I got here, um, which I think we can end with. So my question gets back a little bit to um, what Gihad was asking about the lawyers, the lawyers who I know are so crucial to your story and so much um, gave you so much inspiration, these real warriors. And, and I wanted um, to hear you reflect a bit about your own uh, journey with them, especially, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of through the streets of Beirut as you were running a center for American studies at the American University in Beirut. And of course here, um, you know, being the center for Middle East studies, sort of where we are thinking through how do different disciplines intersect and how you as Lisa Hajar speak across these disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's my question. Okay. And okay, I'll let you go. And then, okay. And I won't take too long. To, just, I know it's getting late, but um, so the, I mean, the question of the lawyers, like I have learned so much from the lawyers who have been, you know, informants that have become friends in this project. But one of the things about lawyers um, is that, you know, they, and especially for, you know, as I said before, like so many of the things that occurred and that lawyers ended up getting involved in, it had to be lawyers because the Bush administration legalized the illegal, was that, you know, you get people who are incredibly intelligent and well-educated, but who are, going into terrain that is uncharted and that they are not in any way trained or prepared to deal with. And so it was really fat. And so like in some ways, you know, a couple of people who've been, you know, myself and a few others who, you know, got to sort of were like in this at the start of it with when lawyers started pushing back, you know, who had sort of experienced dealing with torture and other related issues or, or war, you know, where U.S domestic lawyers didn't have that experience was sort of seeing them you know learn you know on the on the job and that's an incredible experience to see adults like intelligent adults learning things and figuring out what to do so i think that's been part of a really interesting um uh aspect. I mean, one thing, you know, I'm one of the founding members of something called the torture list, which was a listserv that was created in February 2005. And it's got, you know, it's sort of a, a listserv for like lawyers and journalists and others, you know, it's <laughs> all about torture. And it's just been an incredible experience to, you know, have all these people, law professors, military lawyers, human rights lawyers, et cetera, journalists, to, you know, really be, you know, uh, ex exposing what they don't know or seeking information and then people, you know, sort of bringing what they know to the, to the table or to the, to the email. But what Shireen had mentioned about, um, the Beirut aspect was I did have the privilege of being a visiting professor at the American University of Beirut for a couple of years, and I was affiliated with the um, Center for American Studies and Research, and, you know, it was the 2000, it was like the early years of, I was probably Obama's second term during that period. And so, you know, I was not only doing my work on torture, but also targeted killing and other people who were involved at the center for, um, you know, KSAR, as his acronym goes, were also working on aspects of the war on terror. And so um, I invited 
three of the lawyers, the death penalty lawyers, two from the from the 9-11 case and one from the case um, representing uh, Abdul Rah uh, Rahim al-Nashiri, who's being charged with the bombing of the USS Cole, but invited them one at a time to come to Beirut and talk about their work and their experiences, you know, and it particularly powerful to have them, um, you know, speaking to largely non-American audiences, like the, the community and students at AUB and faculty are, you know, Arabs and Europeans, and there are some Americans as well, but it, it's, I think, a very refreshing thing. But my, my sort of the even, uh, uh, Sherry was sort of alluding to, like, one of my, you know, failed more evil uh, missions was like to try and get one of these guys to like spill the classified beans, you know, because like these guys know so much classified information, but they are not even stuff that is known. Like I can say to one of those, any one of those lawyers, say, the CIA ran a black site in Poland, and they can be like, I can neither confirm nor deny, and you know, like they are barred under criminal penalty from talking about that. So it was really exciting and challenging to figure out how we could have these really in-depth one-on-one conversations as we're walking the streets of Beirut, where we could, you know, I could learn things from them. They could possibly learn, you know, a thing or two from me, and then, you know, but that they would maintain their ability to keep classified information secret. And so it's like you're watching people who are literally hostage to the U.S. government, you know, unwilling hostages because they must keep government secrets that they have no interest in keeping. But if they let those secrets out, they could face very serious consequences for themselves. So it's a you know, it's a very, I don't know if I answered your question, it's sort of a Yeah, long, yeah, <laughs> no, that's wonderful. And while we have more questions, I am, I am um, conscious that it's 6.30 and, you know, we've enjoyed every single minute of this event. I think I'll um, conclude with a question from Colleen, a question that's about justice. And I'm just gonna summarize it and ask, is justice possible? Justice is possible, but not in the Guantanamo military commissions. I mean, I think that it is, it's harder now because of the fact that the law itself in this country has been so damaged, you know, by this history and the inability to acknowledge our, our errors and mistakes. I mean, you know, what constitutes you know, it's it's an injustice that Dick Cheney is walking free. It's an injustice that John Yu, um, who is the author of several of the key torture memos to legalize torture, is a distinguished professor at Berkeley. That's an injustice. You know, there are, you know, the, the people who died on 9-11 and then the people, you know, the first responders who subsequently died. There's so much injustice, but it was like deliberate, intentional policy choices that made justice, you know, impossible. But there are still, you know, the United States is not the only game in town. I mean, there are, you know, a number of lawyers involved in these issues have used um, the European Court of Human Rights as another venue for seeking certain kind of justice. And so, you know, if we think about the law as a, or the legal terrain as a battlefield, you can say that there are places where battles can be won and places where you can't even fight because like the ground has been salted and whatever. I mean, there's just, I don't think there's one single answer, but, you know, I always, uh, you know, I think that if we lose uh, the sense of the, the importance of justice, then we might as well give it all up. It's like, you know, you may not get justice, but the need to the recognition that it matters and that people are struggling for it is good. Okay. I think that's a really powerful place to conclude the centrality of justice. Thank you, Gihad. Thank you so much, Gihad. Thank you so much, Lisa. We're Thank so you. And thanks to everybody who came. Uh, you yes, know, and thanks, thanks to everybody who came. So many yeah. people. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.